is burning energy, enormous amounts all the time, right? You're producing protein and killing protein. But, uh, so these are the reactions we have here. But none of these reactions are necessarily binding and binding are, the only, are probably the only two that you, 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 you can fix. So it becomes very interesting, actually. Uh, there are a few reactions that are with binding and binding. It would actually, that, are, that, that satisfy microscopic reversibility. These are the ones that can sort of do temperature control and be happy. The ones that are just burning energy, temperature may be a small thing. But uh, there are situations that I, as, as you would see tomorrow on the system, I am just great situation. Uh, if you make binding very slow, very fast, and completely change the mechanism of the system, that's something that really do molecular control of those things. And, uh, well, the urge burning in principle could you also use control because it's oh, it's good. It's it's good. But that's much harder for, for you to do this connection with the molecular world. Well, I mean, there's some proportionality to ATP concentration. I like for you to do that. I'll tell you <laughs> practices. It's more, no, it, it can be done. It's more, it, it is more complicated. It's, it's sort of a, uh, sort of a, Cool thing to explain. The other thing is, and actually it's interesting, is basic, that's why you're trying to understand the reactions. Basically, uh, you want to understand when, when you say that the cell reacts with stress and some genes switch from one state to another state. Can you now understand what is what the consequence of a particular stress? So if basically I hope in the future when someone says, if I put a bacteria and I severely change the pH and make life very miserable and you switch to another state and we figure out exactly which of the rates that have been changed and why they have been changed for that thing. Then I think it's, it's sort of a, a direction that you really want to go, basically, because uh, it, it, and, and there's ways to spread points. They stay doing much less. How you actually now relate what the molecular phenomenon because the bottom line is the DNA networks you have change of molecular rates affecting behavior at the cellular level and that's sort of a, that's a cool interface. Okay. You had a graph ratio of comparison to simulation of the property of the and simulation had some stuff in the issue. Can you comment on that? Who likes graph? This one? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so the, the, the book are, is, uh, that's a numerically exact calculation, right? This, 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 is, this is not, uh, we're not, we're not fitting anything over here, yeah? But this is, this is the way you get, uh, uh, well, uh, it, well, if I, if I ran a lot more trajectories to average, again, then yes, yes, this, they should, uh, they should, they should converge to the book area, yes. This is, this actually is a good question, it's a very good comment, you didn't highlight or not, but I think it's good to raise. These systems that you can actually do both ways, and there are very few systems you can actually do both ways by simulation and full numerical integration. These are the ones that can give you a lot of feel of how long you have to run the simulations, how much sampling you have to do. Yes, how bad the sampling is. Are you happy with that level of sampling or not? We can discuss that later. But that difference, the difference is, is what's telling you. And that's... Okay. Switching the binding state by uh, 
that just means like the the chain that's bound or unbound, uh, you know, changes its binding state. But that's that's not that's not what I was uh, that's not what I was calling switching time. Yeah? Yeah, so this is a so so when so this will be here. This is a bad switch. Yeah, this is a bad switch. Why is that a bad switch? This is a bad switch. First of all, because uh, there's a lot of things in the middle here where you have a, where you have both proteins being expressed, right? But see this guy coming over here. That's because um, or this guy coming over here. That's a when when someone goes from here to there. That means that both genes are unbound over here. Then one of the genes gets bound, and that protein stops being produced, right? So then he goes over there. Okay. Now when the guy is over here, and uh, the protein that was bound gets unbound, then that protein uh, starts being produced. Right? Uh, the protein that the regular starts being produced, and then it, then it goes towards the new so so that's, a, that, that's, that's a change in body state. If, if we had a good switch, we wouldn't have any of this over here. We would have this peak over here, this peak over here, and we'd be watching this for like uh, an hour, and it would just be hanging out over here. And eventually, through fluctuations, it would uh, come towards the origin over here, and maybe come over here. Yeah, that would, that would that was what we would see in a good switch. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about the next slide? Because I think it looked, there were two different levels. Mm -hmm. Are these also different states, or are these like? These are different. These are different binding states. So mm -hmm. over here in the bottom, this, this is this is a, the same the same. Uh, the same plot as before, but here we're just dividing it in, into in, into three planes, yeah, representing. Go back one slide. So this we have here is the same as here. See, this is one surface, right? And this is probability, okay? So now over here, the the contour curves over here are the probability, and it, and I divided this this surface into three different surfaces. The bottom one, with, uh, uh, where both of the genes are, are bound. The middle one, where, where one gene is bound, the other one is is, uh, is unbound. And the top one, where, where both of the genes are, are unbound, where both of the genes are producing proteins, right? And uh, and you can't go from one to the other to the middle here because if you have on off, you can go to off on through one move, right? You have you have to go either yeah, through off off or through on off. Okay, so that's why I just like added added the on off and off on. So how so how how would, you, how would the switch trajectory look like here? Same as before. Uh, it would uh, it would be jumping up and down over here. It, it, it would look like this. It would look like this, but I mean. So just to make sure, the, the rate of binding and unbinding.
and depend on the sort of sort of molecular rates and things like yeah. that. So a real switch state. That's that clear. The two peaks correspond to different to, 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 to different decisions of the cell. You don't want to switch from one to the other really fast. Yeah. You really want each of them to be. And that I think should become clear tomorrow with a real example. Yeah. Okay.
to to sell for people uh, why the, it's important to, to use the the pressure dimension in addition to other ways to perturb the equilibrium of proteins. So, uh, as I mentioned, I, I had a, you know, before I had prepared a lot of slides uh, and MR, but I won't go too much. So, I'll just come back to this question that uh, uh, Ana Paula uh, addressed quite well uh, that uh, NMR can be a very good tool to, to explore the dynamic of proteins, and so you can. Uh, by using different uh, pulse sequence and uh, different techniques and uh, using uh, uh, especially in the, the last five to eight years one can use uh, by isotopic lighting one can do can get information from the, the picosecond or even from the uh, from around so picosecond uh, Time window to even to the microsecond the time window, so on, and explore all that. I mean, of course, there are a lot of drawbacks with the NMR techniques. So one of them, of course, is is, uh, is protein concentration that a lot of the intense proteins start to aggregate sometimes. But anyway, one can look all these uh, motions from atomic fluctuations to to protein folding by using NMR. And of course, I mean. Uh, cut that, that part of my talk too, but in, especially when you are using uh, T1, T2, and uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear overhouse effects, one can compare a lot with the molecular dynamics in a nanosecond time scale. That's another representation. This review is quite nice. Although I'm in this NMR center and the coordinator there, I don't know too much NMR. So once in a while, I, I read the reviews, and this review is quite nice. I don't know. Right, but and, and it's, it's quite good, and, and, and especially in, uh, in showing how one can explore to to to, to tackle uh, several problems in biology. In this case, it was uh, specific to to enzymes, and, uh, and uh, a lot of the, the questions about enzymes can be uh, yeah, approached by NMR. So. Now I want to give, so I would say, if I try to be to have this 15-minute course on fluorescence spectroscopy. Fluorescence is uh, is, uh, is quite important tool. I mean, if you if you take biochemi biochemistry journal, biochemistry, biophysics, and uh, uh, even chemistry, 50% uh, of the journals they use fluorescence in one way or another. So you and uh, you can use fluorescence to to study, uh, to look for molecular interaction at the atomic and molecular level. Uh, it, it can use uh, in cell biology, and, and also can use, like in this case, this um, mouse that, that, you know, that is a protein that's labeled with the, the green fluorescent protein, so you can follow, uh, ask a question about the, 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 the whole animal and do the imaging, and of course today, that the equipments are getting better and better, so you can combine uh, uh, MRI equipments like the image by NMR with fluorescence equipments that you can have sometimes higher resolutions. And, uh, and also you can use fluorescence for, to do high throughput uh, screening and, uh, and, and of course you know the, uh, this new era of, of uh, the ways to, to, for example, there is a uh, quite a, uh, a big uh, challenge that uh, in a few years there will be, that it will be possible to, to sequence a, a human genome in uh, one day or two days, and that will depend a lot on uh, fluorescence uh, dyes, etc. But you also, I mean, like, like I mentioned, so I mean, you can ask a lot of questions in, in all these fields, uh, and you know of them, of course, you have these connections of, a, uh, of a, a broad field that would be biophotonics. And, uh, but I want, uh, why I'm saying about, uh, why I'm trying to sell fluorescence, I mean, this man it was Gregory Weber, so in fact I met with the Nelson Champagne-Urbain, I was passing my second time then in 
then, I think I was there first time, 1985, as a, I don't know, I had just finished the medical school, I was there. The guy said, well, come, you, are, you will have a medical degree, you can come as a postdoc, so I went, went there. And uh, Gregor, I mean, was famous to have, I mean, 8% of uh, the applications of, uh, of fluorescence in biology. He had something thing to do with it. I mean, he discovered the, pro the fluorescence of proteins, uh, and its transfer between uh, tyrosine and tryptophan. Uh, he synthesized the dyes, the CFDs, and so forth. So, uh, uh, and that more or less states what I have just mentioned, and, uh, and then say that uh, he uh, is one of the few individuals that contributed a lot to the field, and uh, so on. And uh, in fact, I mean, if you look back to forests, I mean, that will make a very short uh, <coughs> historical review. And uh, in fact, the, the word for us was coined by George Stokes because he was uh, dealing with a solution of thinking sulfate, and then he found that uh, there, were, you know, there were colors that were shifted to higher wavelengths. In fact, we use that expression as a Stokes shift. And, and then he uh, was, in fact, the first person that uh, gave the name for us and was, had been. Uh, formula uh, described in fact by John Heschel. And then basically fluorescence, you, will, you will have a, an excitation and then have an emission spectrum. We'll comment about that. Usually the emission uh, spectrum is, is a, an energy of the excitation spectra. You can also have the phosphorescence that when you have a, um, the system cross, it will talk a little bit more later. And uh, of course, I mean, and then there are many contributions in the chemistry initially, and then I will go through too much the part of the, otherwise I will spend all my one hour here to start to talk about the, the Gregorius discoveries. But basically, fluorescence is, is, is quite uh, interesting. Also, I mean, it was very important I mean, when people start to, the beginning of the 20th century, the uh, quantum mechanics, I mean, one of the first, I mean, uh, very good uh, um, uh, experimental proof of, of the quantum mechanics was uh, fluorescence because you have this transition between the ground state and you have a absorption that's here and then the absorption occurs in a, without change in the nuclear coordinates so you can note that the, the, the excitation state is a little bit shift to, to the, in this, in the nuclear piston a little bit to the, to the left, and then you, you are so usually you are in the, so you have the, in this case, two, two well, the ground state and the excited state, you have the vibrational states, and of course uh, you can also design the station states here too, so usually you go from uh, the lowest vibration state to, to the highest vibration state of uh, the first excited state, and then as you see, there is another way to look. Usually, the fluorescence occurs from the, the lowest vibration uh, level to, to back to the, the ground state. And of course, because of these properties and because of this time window, uh, and because fluorescence, I mean, this is, of course, less than um, in 10 minus 15 uh, seconds, that plays continuously, and then you have some. Uh, Normalization that occurs in around 10 to minus 12 seconds, and then this and the fluorescent emission has a whole uh, time of uh, the universe for this, this uh, molecular fluctuation to occur. So that's why uh, it, it can prove a lot of the uh, changes in biology, tumbling uh, <coughs> uh, of molecules, etc., and energy, energy transfer, etc. So that's the other thing. It's very simple. I mean, if you because it, it, the transition between the ground state and the excitation state involves, for example, if you have a, a absorption of a, of a green light that corresponds to about 142 kilojoules per mole, and then that means that uh, if there is no uh, light exciting the the molecules, 
instantiation it would be very rare, so it would be uh, 1 to 10 to 37. So the majority of the electrons occupy the ground state to be there sort of excitation. So then, of course, you can excite. So, so here, the, it's called the Jadron's diagram. If you excite the use light to excite, you can jump either to the to the uh, first uh, level of excitation to S1, or you can go to S2. You, you need, of course, this point of light. You can do it, uh, and uh, Andrea is going to give a talk on, on Thursday about two fold excitation. I mean, that for some specific condition, you can use two photons to, to, to give this. Uh, this uh, uh, back of uh, energy, and then once you are either in, in, uh, in higher uh, excitation levels or low excitation levels, you have transition from the, the higher uh, vibration state or even from the higher excitation state back to the to the, the lowest ground state of uh, the lowest vibration state of the uh, S1. And then from there, you can have fluorescence. This time window that may vary from um, super nanoseconds to hundreds of nanoseconds, that will depend on the dye. And of course, we can have uh, a decay without emission of light, and you can have other processes that will compete with uh, the fluorescence emission. You can have a uh, solvent relaxation, I'll talk a little bit more, or you can also have this uh, change with the electrons here. The, uh, there is a change in, uh, in spin, and then you can have transition to this state, and then you eventually may have uh, phosphorescence. Uh, look, this change in energy is much lower. So, if we look, we are just going back. So, most emission question uh, energy transfer, chemical reaction, we will, co we will call in this window. So, if you, you can use Fluorescence, I mean, to measure polarization, for example, measure rotation of uh, molecules, of proteins and macromolecules. We can measure the, the distance between uh, donors and acceptors looking in this window. So, I'll go past a little bit more. So, just uh, some of the properties, I mean, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, because there is, some, there is symmetry between the excitation and the emission, was going to have the, the, the emission spectrum is going to be the, um, the mirror image of the uh, excitation, and uh, unless you have some uh, excited state reaction. So, and then some of the excited really state reactions uh, that are very um, uh, used in, uh, in biology, and uh, especially now to, uh, to follow, for example, uh, some uh, events in the cell look at uh, single molecule interactions in, inside the cell. One can use, and Jose also pointed out that, uh, I think it was yesterday, I think, you can use, uh, uh, you can do this measurement. So for example, protein, if it's folding, of course, this distance is going to, to decrease. And then you can follow that as a function of time at very good uh, conditions. So using a laser, you can have a very good, uh, good yield of uh, the emission, so you, uh, the, the, the um, energy transfer will occur if there is an overlap between the emission spectrum of the donor and the uh, uh, social spectrum of the, uh, of the receptor, and then you have the sensitized the emission. So you can use that. Uh, that's the R0, that's uh, distance for different pairs of uh, donor and receptor for where you have 50% of uh, energy transfer. So one can, for example, measure the, uh, uh, the, 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 the distance between a tryptophan residue and a, a dye that is bound to, to, to the protein, for example. So it's a different, or you can even label the protein with a, at some specific position. So when you are talking about fluorescence, I mean, a lot of uh, people use fluorescence and just get the data. Uh, because it's such a, uh, a, a good tool, very fast, also is a good source of, uh, uh, of bad data sometimes, so of artifacts. 
So one has to be very careful with artifacts to have other uh, uh, change, well, uh, competing effects that are occurring. You have the Raman line, you have uh, there are many uh, possibilities, and uh, if you're not careful, you can get uh, this artifact. So, especially now when you are transferring uh, what we know from uh, from forest uh, uh, solution, if you take it to the microscope and if you're trying to get information in the cell, that might be very dangerous. So, you have to be careful and to, to pay attention about the, all that, and of course. The, you need to have, uh, if you want to have good forest, you need to have dyes or marks that have saw that has a, a good uh, values of uh, efficient of the coefficient very high, so that can vary from uh, 5,000 to 200,000, for example, uh, centimeters per moment, minus one. Of course, if you want to have a good quantum yields, I mean, I remember my first project when I went to champagne Urbana. Uh, the Gregory Webb was nice. He had 50% of, of his ideas were very good. Well, 100% of his ideas were very good. <laughs> but 50% were you, you were dead end because I mean, he want he want me to to determine the forest with the tip type bonds because if I couldn't measure the forest of the tip type, well, it, it absorbs from 220 and so forth. If I could measure that, I could we, we could make fluorescent as uh, to develop a map to atomic uh, uh, resolution because then you have to have the information along the old background. I mean, and then we're doing that. The idea was to use uh, phase modulation as a lifetime and so forth. But why so little? I mean, why it's very difficult? Uh, because that could have killed my postdoc when I was there. So, <laughs> fortunately, the, I had to do this experiment in you know, Frascat, in synchro, uh, the, the synchrotron Frascat, and I was the first, uh, I had received the first fellowship from the synchrotron lab to go there to Urbana, but to do the experiments in Frascat. And then, uh, the only good remembrance of the, those trips was the good wine in, in uh, Italy, because <laughs> the experiments never worked. Anyway. So we also have to be careful about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the excitation wavelengths and uh, uh, you have to worry about the stability. I mean, because the dyes, especially if you are, they are, if you use, for example, uh, under the object of a microscope, they, they can, they can, uh, and, uh, they, they, they decompose very fast. You have to, to, to handle the lifetime if you want to do, you, uh, you have, to know the the, the, uh, the properties of uh, the dyes you analyze, and tryptophan has a short lifetime, around three to four nanoseconds. Pyrene, for example, uh, has a, around 100 nanoseconds, so you have to be careful. I mean, because if you are dealing with a uh, 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 reaction with excited state, I mean, if it decays before it reacts, then it will be a wall. And then, of course, I mean, that's this uh, that the probe used has to be an expectator and not uh, uh, and not an actor uh, in the in our experiment. So usually you try to 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 go through all those and uh, you measure quantum yields. I mean that depends, of course, not only on the rate of uh, fluorescence uh, uh, decay, but uh, also. In the, in the sum of the rates you know, uh, of uh, other reactions that compete with the, uh, the, the radioactive decay. So and then you have uh, models that have very high uh, quantum use. Sometimes you have models that have very low quantum use, and you can use that, for example, anilina phthalene sulfonase, that they have very low quantum use in water, and when it's bound to a, to a hydrophobic polymer, the protein is a, it has a high quantum use. So you can use fluorescent quench to, to measure uh, the excess of a uh, solvent to, to the, where the, uh, the, the dye is bound, so that has been used quite a lot. And, uh, but you have also to be careful because you can have a, a dynamic quench, so the molecule goes to the excited state, it can be quenched during the excited state, but sometimes you can have a stack quench because it, 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 the, the quench complex will the, uh, with, with the dye and then it, it prevents the, uh, 
social life. So that's just another way to, to look at that. So you can, from that you can go to the other. So you can have an equation, so you can calculate the diffusion uh, of the quenching to the site where it, it, it makes the, the quenching, and then uh, in the, this, this equation won't work if you have a dynamic quench. That means that the, the decrease in fluorescence, uh, so that's the uh, original fluorescence, that's the fluorescence that increases the, the quencher, uh, uh, change uh, in proportion to the, the, the change in the decrease in lifetime. So you can use that, for example, uh, you can add, for example, this was used, uh, I don't have the slide here, but was the, uh, the first uh, good uh, experimental proof that proteins have dynamics, that the shuffle was done by Lakovics, in fact, that they, they had the oxygen there, they have the, uh, the probe inside the, the microbe, and so they were looking uh, the uh, penetration of the oxygen, that would not, the, the only way to that occur uh, at the, the constant, uh, the diffusion constant they had was because the protein was uh, briefing, uh, uh, changing, and had, had some dynamics that they could measure experimentally. So you can use, for example, like we use uh, Monica that's here, she did a lot of animal work, and then she found the structure of this uh, peptide that uh, is a peptide responsible to, 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 to fuse with the target membrane, and then, uh, then that was the structure, and then it needs a lot of, of this tryptophan and this uh, phenylalanine, and then when, in fact, when it binds to the to micelles or to membranes, the, there is not only the, the spec shifts to the, the blue, but also one can see that uh, the, uh, it, it becomes much less accessible to this uh, to, to a in this case what is a grillamide, right? So, of course you have, as I mentioned, you have to be careful with the stat quench because that, that react not be an excited state react, so not depend, not change the, the lifetime. Uh, as I already mentioned, so the emission spectra is, it has quite a, a lot of information, so you can use that I mean, sometimes people ask me, why, why you plot uh, uh, your spectra sometimes in terms of wave numbers and not uh, wavelength? Because wave numbers are proportional to, to, to energy, and then you, one can follow, uh, and, and what you can uh, follow, for example, if you have a reaction on protein that uh, is getting the nature, in this case by guanitine, hydrochloride, I want to talk about the protein right now, but in fact tomorrow, as you increase the quantity hydrochloride concentrate, so you shift the spectra to, to the red as, as the tryptophan becomes exposed, so you can do a titration curve. Instead of plotting the average uh, wavelength, the best way to do it is to plot the, uh, the, the average change in, in, uh, in, in the energy as the spectrum so spectra shifts to, um, to higher uh, wavelengths. You can use that, for example, in the probe, that uh, if, for example, is an experiment done by uh, Jeremiah Marriott, if the, pro the, the proteins in the group uh, is uh, soluble and globular, it, it, uh, it, the, the probe is, is exposed to the sol solvent. So now if, uh, it, if the protein polymerized, you can, you can see the polymerization of actin that can be done, of course, in the QVAT, but also in, the, um, in, in, in cells. The other uh, very useful uh, application, one of the features of uh, uh, you want to, 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 to use for us is to measure molecular tumbling that can be done, can be taken care by fluorescent polarization. So use uh, polarize to polarize the light. So you can, uh, because uh, molecules will be, there is a, be a, there will be a fault selection then only those molecules that are oriented to the electrodact of the light so that will be excited and then during the lifetime of the excited state you can look at the tumbling so then you can measure the uh, state, the state, state conditions, the polarization that's by just measuring density uh, uh, parallel minus intensity uh, um, perpendicular 
particular process sum, you can get a, 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 the amount of polarization. In principle, in solution, the probe can have a maximum polarization of 0.5. Uh, and that, of course, it, it varies sometimes because sometimes, of course, not the, the excitation uh, dipole is different than emission dipole, so we have uh, only for us saying that it's about 0.49, but for example, crypto fan maximum can get about 0 0.4. And then I just showed, like to show that that Gregor Weber, he did this measure in 1952. He published two papers. He called the equation of the Han equation. In fact, he discovered the equation. Uh, I tend to say it's a Behan Weber equation, but uh, uh, it was based, of course, on the, on the work of Behan in uh, molecular motion. And, uh, and he published these two papers, one that was a theoretical paper and one that was a, 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 a paper where he, he synthesized the dye, the benzyl, that uh, he made a covalent product to the protein so he could measure uh, the, the, the dumping of the protein. So just here, just to show, uh, for example, if you have a, a rhodamine in glycerol at a very low temperature, then they we're going to have the maximum polarization. On the other hand, if we have water at room temperature, the, uh, it, uh, by the time of the excited state, we'll get completely depolarized. And then, of course, if it's now attached to a uh, nucleic acid, or DNA, or RNA, or drug protein, you can have uh, an indication of the molecular size so that, can be, that has been used quite a lot, for example, to measure interaction between uh, 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 transcript, transcription factors to, to nucleic acid, for example. Just one of the few uh, 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 application. Of course, you always have more local motion too, so ideally, you, uh, in addition to measure at the steady state condition, one is important sometimes to do dynamic measure during the, the, the decay of the um, polarized state, so that can be done too. So, and also for us, sometimes also we will not go through all the um, technical, technicalities of the measurement, but again, quite important to, uh, and then uh, maybe a little bit further we'll show some of the examples that it's important to, to, to measure lifetime. You can be, you can, this can be done in the time domain, or you like NMR that is done in time domain and it's converted frequency. So you can also uh, do fluorescence lifetime measurements in the frequency domain and just by the uh, way transform to, to take, to go to the, to the, to get the, uh, to cover the, the, the values of the lifetime. So, so just, just uh, I mean, this is an excellent book. I mean, of Lakovics, people from Graton's lab said, oh, <laughs> there is some competition. I mean, they were, I mean and uh, uh, Joe Lakovics, he, when he was doing this experience with oxygen, then he had, uh, he was also, he was so interested also in high pressure. That he decided to use oxygen to do the high pressure experiment and that blew up. His, on his face, and so people that know him. So, he, but he's a very fantastic person. He, he had this book, the first edition, people were a little bit upset because, well, that's a copy of the World uh, 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 class. I mean, but he put the reference, he, and then uh, this is the improved version, and it's a very good book. Uh, I won't go through too much about the probes, there are many uh, possibilities of probes. Intrinsic and extrinsic probes, uh, you can use the, the more recent that uh, there are the quantum dots, and the, the famous one is the uh, those probes that you, you don't need to, 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 to interfere with the system, so especially the green fluorescent protein, the, the protein from the, the jellyfish, that's quite uh, important because you don't, you, you can uh, make Fusion, uh, fusion uh, proteins, or even have the signaling of a gene, for example. So, just a, uh, another overview of a different uh, amino acid for a tryptophan uh, that uh, means five, six to seven times less fluoresce from uh, tyrosine from tryptophan, but they usually have much more tyrosine. From, and in phenylalanine, they continue to very low, so they have very then you have uh, the possibility of some amino acids, some cofactors, and of course you have uh, the fluorescent protein, as I mentioned. So you can use also, uh, that's quite useful, for example, to measure 
uh, states of uh, partial folded states use uh, some uh, uh, either ANS or BZNS that would bind to to the to the hydrophobic uh, box and, and as the protein start to to unfold but to the nation to get this molten global conformation. You can use covert label and as a nation you can use the this genetic encode for us proteins from jellyfish. So these are the original papers that describe this protein and the protein that has done a lot of the characterization and uh, and uh, propagation of the of the of the use of the GFP. And uh, and then, and the reason why it makes is uh, the genetic encode this protein is because this to the, 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 the dye would be inside the protein, if of course the protein is denatured and uh, there, there's no more fluorescence, and it's encoded exactly by this uh, reaction that occurs between these three amino acids with use and then a cyclization, a cyclization reaction that occurs and then that gives the, the, the props of absorption and emission in a very high, in a very good field. And more recently, People have done some uh, uh, change, uh, and then you have in, in different uh, other proteins have been obtained. For example, you can have red shifts, to, and then you can use, for example, measure uh, uh, FRED and, and cells, for example, this, and this use too. So you can have a combination of uh, different uh, genetically encoded proteins. So that was not exact 50 minutes, but uh, the idea is to show, as an overview, that uh, fluorescent can be, I mean, quite used. And uh, another thing that is important, I mean, especially because you are also here, uh, physics, I mean, a lot of the photophysics was worked out, I mean, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, there are a lot of possibilities, of course, that, uh, I mean, we have more recently the development of uh, photon spectroscopy, but still there are a lot of possibilities about uh, the extraordinary. I mean, all the photophysics that I mentioned to single photo uh, spectroscopy change for true photon spectroscopy. And, uh, and then I'm sure that uh, Andrea will also take care of that. So in the second part of my talk, I want to explore a little bit more uh, why uh, when we want to, especially when, when this, the system starts to get a little bit more complicated, and then one can say, well, you start to have a little bit more roughness in the, in the landscape, or more complex landscape, it's quite important to extend the, uh, your, your experimental acts to, to, the, to the pressure uh, window. So that's just a curve, I think, uh, uh, that I also mentioned uh, yesterday. So, I mean, uh, of course, this is a quite a general way to look at So, uh, the protein would be made in this, inside this uh, PT diagram. So, if you increase the temp, you hit the nature. So, notice that then you have a bottom change that is, uh, is used to uh, higher than zero. And, uh, and, and uh, an entalpy change that's higher than zero. So the, here the food, in fact, is uh, supposedly entalpy. So in this way, uh, delta H from here, from the food to the native state, is negative. On the other hand, if you, if you lower the temperature, you can have a cold denaturation, and then you get opposite uh, uh, thermodynamic parameters. So you have the, uh, a reaction that from here to here, from uh, was uh, the unfolding was uh, topically driven, is just the opposite. So the unfolding is a topically driven. That means that the folding is driven by entropy, and not by entropy in this way. So, and of course, if you have a, this diagram, can be quite explored very well because under pressure you can explore in a much better way. Uh, the cold denaturation because if you you can have uh, liquid state uh, uh, down to minus 20 degrees. So of course, I mean, as I mentioned a little bit more, uh, this the states over here would be average 
unfolded state. But very unlikely, uh, unless for very simple protein, very unlikely they, they will be exactly the same here and here. Otherwise, that would be crazy. I mean, why? I mean, it, 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 of course, we can explain by chance and heat capacity, but uh, for a larger protein, that means may mean that from going to here, from here to here, you are completely unfolding a protein, and from here to here, maybe you are going to uh, some of these uh, uh, intermediates. So it's quite important that it's not new. I mean, that has been done by s several people, but it was done first by speak by uh, Suzuki. 1960, that he did that for uh, ovalbumin and hemoglobin, so he designed the, the PT diagram. And uh, we uh, have, uh, we and others have used high pressure not only to denature protein, but also to, only to dissociate. So that's a ca very simple cartoon that, uh, I mean, when you try to to sell the, the technique, you try to make it very simple, and it's not simple, of course. So the proteins denature by pressure or dissociate by pressure because uh, the states, uh, the native states or the associated state, they, they have a lot of volumes, either because they have uh, cavities that uh, become empty when the protein denature or dissociate, or also, or, and or, you have uh, uh, hydration of those uh, of, uh, of those surfaces, of that surface that are exposed. Uh, a lot of people, including Jose, has done a, a lot of the theories about the how what's the mechanism of a of the pressure denaturation. I like to use these. There was an additional cartoon here with the women's, uh, and, but some people said, "Well, we need also the men." So I couldn't find the men. <laughs> Uh, but to show that uh, uh, in, uh, it's pretty much like in Copacabana or Ipanema, uh, the proteins go to the usually to the partial food of the state when they uh, denature by pressure. So one affects and get wet, but still, in several of the proteins they they still maintain a lot of the uh, of those uh, intermediate states and uh, some a lot of the secondaries that can be observed. So back here to the diagrams, we have uh, maybe, uh, we don't, like uh, for uh, any other, like thermal denaturation or chemical denaturation, one can uh, uh, pick 100 possibilities, but for pressure denaturation, you, you, you don't have so, so, so many, there are not too many groups. We have just had a meeting in Santa Fe now, and we're, I don't know, six people. And, uh, that, and it was myself and Deborah and White, and they want to, to squeeze, to, to go away, to buy something to the kid. But it was so difficult because, I mean, the two people going out, I mean, it's a, it's a, a good fraction <laughs> of the meeting. So <laughs> that's, uh, maybe there's less competition, but then uh, it's more fun when you have more, uh, uh, when you have more people. And anyway, so why? I mean, so then at the other question, why protein denature or, or associated with pressure? I mean, pressure uh, shifted the cleave was uh, smaller volumes, but why the proteins, they have large volumes? So one, of course, there are several molecular interpretations. Uh, volume protein, you have, uh, in addition to the volume of the uh, atom, the constituted protein, you also have the, the cavities because you cannot satisfy all, all the um, 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 proximities and uh, the Van der Waals uh, uh, distance. So you, you, you cannot satisfy all uh, at all. And then you, you have carrots that in most, most of the cases they are not hydrates, so they, it's quite empty. And then of course, uh, again, if you, and you have also some change in, in hydration when the protein goes from the, from the unfolded state to the native state. And then, of course, in addition to the volume change, I don't know if you notice here, so we make it very, uh, the change, if, if, you, if you change pressure, change the free angle of the interaction, that depends on the volume change. We can draw straight lines, experimental straight line, but we know that it's not that simple, I mean, because we have a, other video factors, because the completeness will also change, but the complexity of this is very likely to be a little bit different in this one. 
So, but in principle, especially in the dissociation reaction, you are very well in, in, in getting all the thermodynamic parameters, the, the, uh, the equilibrium constants, and eventually if you change them, you also get the changes in, in entropy and, and entropy. And uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, Suzuki already in 1906. I mean, he talked about the hydration in uh, we like uh, there's a famous uh, um, uh, statement of uh, uh, Joshua Louis Borges, which is an Argentinian writer. They say we we always repeat something. When a writer writes something, he's always repeating something. He's always thinking about something. So that's in science we do that a lot. I mean because we uh, if you read very careful this is good state that he talked a lot of, a lot about the. Uh, the, the, uh, the mechanism of the pressure and operation that would be by hydration. So there is a lot of our work, as I mentioned, theoretical work and experimental work is just uh, a work very late on considered uh, the PDF was <laughs> not good. good. Uh, but if you, for example, if you take a proton, this is after a press, that a small dimer, uh, Molecular weight, each one of them has a 7,000 7, molecular weight and then makes a diamond that is, is a quite a, uh, it, it, it is quite interwined diamond. If, if you apply pressure, you denature the, the diamond, but if you start to add glycerol, then you, sh you, you shift the, the, the curves to high and high pressure. So if you measure the volume change, uh, this volume change will linearly will tend to be uh, zero as you go to 100% glycerol because like it's experimentally it's like to make these lines go all the way there but eventually this will not do that but uh, there is this trend that as you take the water from the from react your reaction you don't have the pressure denaturation so so the other uh, 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 important thing about high pressure because when you do thermal denaturation or chemical denaturation, that is usually a very drastic effect and very cooperative effect. With high pressure, we can vary from, uh, uh, you can go from 1 bar to 1,000 bar, 5,000, 10,000. Usually, if, if nothing happens until 5,000, it will not happen above 5,000 atmosphere. You may need to, to, pose, to pose a little bit of equilibrium by adding uh, other things like uh, chemical denaturation. But most of the case, when the protein that's uh, it should be an a binding protein, when it denatures uh, and dissociates, we found in this case that uh, it, it goes to a compact state, um, much similar to a molten chlorine. So it, it found that it binds uh, uh, ANS, it's compact, and uh, we did run some uh, NMR, and uh, also it, 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 it has some uh, structure when you do the NMR. And uh, so that's the same that's uh, the upper pressure that we did uh, quite some time ago by NMR under pressure. If we, that's, uh, that's the part of the, uh, the beta sheet. So you have the two beta strands from one subin and from the other subin. When, the, when the, they are separated apart by pressure, they tend to form uh, inter subin and the beta sheet. So we could measure that by measuring the NOEs, and it could follow the formation of uh, other NOEs as you go through the intermediate states. Otherwise, under equilibrium condition, even a kinetic was very fast. I mean, you could say that's a ND typical uh, two, uh, uh, two state process. I mean, we could track these uh, intermediates. So we can use also. The nice thing about uh, the other thing about high pressure, because if you if you open the valve, you get back and you have uh, you come back to the original condition very fast. That's very difficult to do when you are uh, like Joseph, uh, someone mentioned that when you cook a protein, if you go back, then very unlikely you will it would be more difficult to get uh, reversible conditions. Here we test reversibility, sometimes we don't have reversibility, but we can lo uh, open the valve and very, uh, we can measure kinetics uh, in doing that, but once we release the pressure, we can look if the system was reversible, 
And in this way, we can do a lot of reactions that, for example, we one can use and have done that quite a lot in other people's tool to, to measure the, the free energy coupling between folding or oligomerization and ligand bind or uh, DNA bind or even RNA bind. There were a couple of papers recently on RNA bind. But there just is a system that we're looking for, we have worked a lot of our compressor that is a dime. So we went to the literature and we picked this protein that at the time, so that's the let's say repressor, was in the books, was, was a monomer. So let's work the monomer. So in fact, there's a dimension here. So when we run the, when we ran the experiment, so with applied pressure, the, 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 the protein denatured by pressure, so that we were looking at the, the emission of the tryptophan. But it, it was, uh, we were surprised when we, did a protein concentration dependence as we increase the protein concentration, uh, we need, it need higher pressure to, uh, to get it in operation. So you can, of course, that's dependent on the protein concentration and exactly from the, this shift in, 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 uh, in P1 half uh, by fitting to the, the more dynamic equation, we found that work. it could only be a diamond, so we could show that it uh, was in fact a diamond, not only by pressure denaturation, but also by real denaturation. And in fact, instead of a monomer uh, that would associate, I think they would say that would associate uh, with a dissociation constant around 100 micromolar, uh, in fact, we found a, a very tight dimer that uh, would have a dissociation constant of a 9 picomolar. And plus, when we add the, the specific DNA, that uh, is the site where the protein binds and gets recognized. And under this condition, of course, if you use these other DNAs, it also binds to those DNAs. But because only this DNA that is the, um, the coconate sequence, there was this uh, linkage between the, the binding and the uh, strengthening or the, uh, and the, the DNA binding and the in the free and free end of uh, association or folding association. 